director Robert Gordon signed a $155,000 severance agreement. Part of that included a confidentiality portion, uh, which many of us found problematic. Since then, the governor and Director Gordon have agreed to remove that confidentiality portion. We have invited Director Gordon here multiple times to testify regarding that. Uh, he refused, and so this committee went down the road of issuing a subpoena, and uh, today he has agreed to appear before this committee. So I want to let some, uh, put some ground rules out there for this. This committee is not here for grandstanding. This is not here to make political points. The point of this committee is to find truth to find out what actually happened. We should have no fear of truth. So with that, I expect committee members to ask good questions. However, I don't expect you to make grandstanding points, which means you do not need a long-standing statement before your question. Get to your question immediately. If you're going more than 10 questions, more than 10 seconds, and you haven't got to your question, I'm going to cut you off. Uh, there's a lot of people in the audience today. Uh, we will have order here. If you make an outbur outburst, the sergeants will remove you. Uh, so with that, also, Robert Gordon, he is an attorney. He is licensed in the state of New York. So he has a professional and an ethical obligation to speak truthfully here today. And I believe that Director Gordon is on Zoom, and he has a prepared statement to start things off. So, Director Gordon, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for being here this morning. My pleasure. So yeah, if you want to start with your statement, and then we'll get into questions after that. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It was a great honor to serve for two years as director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I felt especially privileged to work alongside MDHHS's selfless and superb public servants. You may not know their names, but you know their work because it has saved so many lives. I was an appointee of the governor, not an elected official or a civil servant. It was my responsibility to do my job as best I could, according to the law and with integrity, for as long as Governor Whitmer and I both wished. And as part of my job, it was my responsibility to give Governor Whitmer honest advice. To enable the candor critical to good decision-making, I believed, and continue to believe, that advice should be confidential, especially in an unprecedented emergency. That is the reason I appear today only under this committee's subpoena. However hard my job, Governor Whitmer's was far more difficult. While I had a responsibility to focus on health and human services, she had a responsibility to act based on the full range of considerations touching the well-being of Michiganders. She was ultimately responsible for the state's actions, not me. She has governed effectively in the face of enormous headwinds. The committee has called me to speak about my separation and severance agreement. I will share based on my knowledge and recollection, and I am happy to take the committee's questions. Thank you for that, and you brought up a good point. The subpoena is directly related to the separation agreement and the termination, so any questions here must be around that issue. If they're going out of bounds of that issue, I will rule you out of order. Uh, first up, I believe Representative Hoytinga has a couple questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Gordon, for being here today to testify. We, we appreciate that. Um, just a couple quick questions to start off. Uh, what did you do, if anything, to prepare for this hearing? More specifically, were you coached or assisted by anyone in preparing for this hearing? Uh, I reviewed my uh, I reviewed my recollections of my experience prior to, to while I was in the role, uh, and I do have counsel who have assisted me in preparing. Thank you. Um, have you previously communicated with anyone currently in the administration about this hearing? Um, I was not coach. I, I, I did not share the contents of my of my plan testimony today uh, with anyone outside of my counsel team and uh, you know, and and uh, at a high level, some friends and loved ones. Um, and, and finally, have you previously communicated with any of the legislators on this committee prior to this hearing? Um, I have not. Um, my counsel, I believe, has been in touch with the counsel for both the majority and the minority. Okay, thank you. Representative Outman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Gordon, I want to go through the resignation process. Uh, so you officially resigned on January 22nd of 2021. 
did anyone from the governor's office or the administration um, pressure you, encourage you, or hint that you should resign? Representative, I'll, I'll tell you what happened the morning. Um, I'm sorry, I, I will tell you what happened. Um, the morning, um, excuse me, um, I was called on January 22nd to a, um, a video conference call with several members of the governor's staff. I joined that call and uh, when I arrived, I saw the governor and members of her staff. And the governor said to me, Robert, grateful for your service. I think it's time to go in a new direction. Uh, she subsequently dropped off the call. Mark Totten, the governor's chief counsel, offered me an opportunity to resign, and I did. Were there any threats made to you if you didn't resign? Were there threats? No, there were no threats. Did the governor ever threaten to fire you? As I said, sir, I was given an opportunity to resign, and I did. One thing that I would say is that when you're in a role like this and the governor says, I want to go in a new direction, you accept that judgment and you resign. Thank you, sir. Representative Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I actually believe my question was probably answered, but I do want to say thank you. Thank you for your leadership uh, guiding us through this unprecedented time with this global pandemic. And so just for clarity, um, could you please share with us if there are any other factors that played a role into your decision to voluntarily resign from your position, if there's anything else? The governor said she wanted to go in a new direction. I understood uh, and the governor's team clarified for me that they would offer me an opportunity to resign, and I did so. When you were in a role like this, I was serving as an at-will appointee. It's important that the governor is comfortable, in you in that, is comfortable with you in that role and that you are comfortable in that role. And when it was clear that that was no longer the case, I resigned. Very good. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your candor here this morning. We do really appreciate that. So uh, I think that timeline is very important because a lot of people wonder, was this something that took some significant time that this built up? Was this your decision, her decision? Uh, so you've answered a lot of questions already this morning. We thank you for that. Uh, it sounds like the relationship between you and the governor was rather amicable. Am I right in that assessment? Um, yeah, we certainly had a, a professional relationship, absolutely. Okay. And so that meeting uh, was in the morning. There's an email from Totten, I think it's at 241. Uh, regarding a severance agreement. Uh, is that the first time that the severance agreement was brought up to you? I think he mentioned on the phone call that he would give me the name of an attorney who would tell me more about the possibility of an executive severance agreement. Uh, honestly, I, I didn't really focus on it on that call. Okay, but you, you did not bring up the severance agreement yourself. Is that correct? No, I did not. Okay. Did you bring up that you had legal concerns uh, against the administration? No. Did you indicate to the governor's office or the governor that you would bring a lawsuit at any point in time? No. So did the governor's office have any reason to suspect that you would bring legal claims against them? I don't believe so, no. Okay. Uh, Representative O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gordon, good to see you again. Uh, and thank you, for you. Being, thank you for being here today. Uh, I want to chat a little bit about the, uh, the confidentiality agreement. That's obviously been a topic of hot discussion. Uh, at what point was the confidentiality portion of the agreement first brought up, and uh, who was the first to raise that issue? Um, I spoke, the, Mr. Totten gave me the name of an attorney and uh, with the Department of, can you still hear me? I'm having a problem with the machine. Yeah, hang on, yep, we've we got can a little. Yep, we got a little. All right, yep, you're good yep. to go. I think you're good. Okay, Mr. Totten gave me the name of an attorney with the Department of the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. I reached out to her. She said to me something like, this is how we usually do this. She ran through the provisions. Uh, I think they included a confidentiality clause. She then sent to me via email what she described as a typical agreement. And that agreement contained it in a confidentiality clause. So it was a boilerplate 
confidentiality agreement. Did that surprise you at all to see that there was a, a confidentiality agreement in there? That, that was how she described it to me as a typical agreement. On March 18th, uh, it was announced that uh, you and the governor agreed to remove the confidentiality portion of the uh, severance agreement due to uh, uh, the, you know, the, the outcry about it. Can uh, you tell us about the process to uh, remove that, that language? And uh, did you reach out to the governor or did the governor's office reach out to you about pulling out of that agreement? Uh, I reached out to the governor's office. I felt that it was a distraction. It was all these un lots of suppositions being made that weren't true. My own view was that uh, deliberations, conversations, advice given should remain confidential uh, just as a matter of principle, not because of the agreement. And so I was happy to have it removed. And uh, was, uh, what was the governor's or her staff's response to that? They agreed to remove it. Okay. No uh, discussion back and forth, just a sure, let's do it? They agreed. Okay. Uh, uh, on March 18th, it was announced that uh, the language would be removed. Um, what day did you and the governor's office discuss removing it? Do you remember? I think it had come up. It had come up previously, but it, we agreed to it on the evening of the 17th. Okay. Uh, and when discussing the removal of the uh, language, was there ever any discussion that you should uh, still not speak regarding that termination, even though uh, you were uh, now legally allowed to? They never said to me I should not speak. No, I, I, I think I said to them I wasn't planning to. Okay. Did the uh, governor's office uh, ever speak to you uh, regarding testifying before uh, this committee? Uh, we had some generic conversations about it. So generic conversations about, so next Thursday you're going to be, be busy at yeah, 1030? They never, they never expressed a view about whether I should testify or not. They never expressed to me a view about what I should say. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Legrand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, with your indulgence, I want to ask on two topics, just so we're clear, and I'll be brief. And I'm not yes, intending to. Yes, get to the to... question, but I'm, I'm allowing you multiple questions, just thank no you. long statements. Got it. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, Director, thank you for being here. Um, obviously, there was a, there was a, your agreement included, you know, um, a, a, a dollar figure for uh, release of claims. And I think Chairman, our Chairman has already asked. Um, about potential litigation. I can see looking at you, you're over 25 years old. Um, I don't want to ask your age, but um, you're, you're, and you're a trained lawyer. So let me ask, obviously you could potentially, given your age, um, you know, consider some kind of age discrimination lawsuit anytime you're terminated, given just who you are. Is that a fair statement? I don't know much about age discrimination law, sir, so I, I don't think I can ask. Okay, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to, I mean, you're over 25, I don't want to get any more detailed than that, but uh, that at least, you, you've heard of the concept of age discrimination lawsuits, correct, for termination? Sure. Okay, so that might be a category for you. Um, also, looking at you, I'm guessing that you identify as male, um, and uh, so you can potentially have some um, gender discrimination lawsuit claims, potentially, just by virtue of your status as a male, correct? I believe that's right, sir. So you, so there's potential litigation and, and, and release of claims involved you not being able to make uh, those kinds of suits going forward, whether or not you intended to. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. Okay. Um, the next question I, I wanted to ask is, because I've done a lot of um, termination agreements myself, I, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't see any non-disclosure. I mean, pardon me, any non-disparagement clause in that uh, in the initial agreement. There was a non-disclosure clause, of course, the confidentiality clause. But am I correct that there was not a non-disparagement clause? That's correct. So, in other words, if you wanted to say something nasty about the governor right now, there's nothing in this document that stops you doing that. Correct. That's correct. Thanks. Thank you, Representative. Uh, so did you at any point in time feel or indicate to the governor's office that you felt discriminated against in any manner? No. Okay. That's good. So I guess uh, I want to go to the $155,000 payment, uh, the negotiation there. How did we come up with that number? Um, the, the, in the initial call that I had with the governor's office, they said we can 
make a payment of um, um, the, the, I'm sorry, let me, re, let me restart. The initial call that I had with the attorney at the Department of the Attorney General, she said to me, I'm able to offer a payment of up to six months plus COBRA. She then sent me an agreement. The agreement had a blank in it. I inserted nine months and they agreed. And what exactly was the payment for? The payment was for entering the agreement. Okay, but I guess I'm wondering here, what did the state, the taxpayers, receive in benefit? So you received $155,000. That's the one half of the contract. What does the people in Michigan receive? I mean, what, what did we get for that payment? Uh, sir, I think that's a policy question. In the agreement, as Representative LeGrand was, was describing, I agree to release claims. I agree to confidentiality. I can understand it might be your view that that was not, um, you know, that that's bad policy for the state to enter agreements in this circumstance. I think that's something for you and the governor to consider. I was acting as, a, as at this point, a private citizen. So you did a $155,000 agreement to release claims, but you also indicated to the committee that you didn't have any claims. That's true. So how can you accept a payment to release claims when you had no claims to release? Sir, I, I, again, these are practices in, in human resources matters. I'm not an expert in human resources. I think there are agreements like these entered frequently. They, you know, the governor's office, the, the executive branch has entered them with others. I believe the legislature has entered them with others. I was offered what was described to me as a standard agreement. Um, I accepted, you know, I, I, I was okay with the terms and we closed it out. Okay. No, and I understand severance agreements, they do occur, except constitutionally in Michigan, I want to bring to your attention Article 11, Section 3 of the Michigan Constitution uh, that states, neither the legislature nor any political subdivision of the state shall grant or authorize extra compensation to any public officer, agent, or contractor after the service has been rendered or the contract entered into. The NDA agreement was signed a month after. It was February 22nd. Your resignation was January 22nd, so it's clearly afterwards. You are a public officer. There's uh, multiple AG opinions clarifying that. So to me, it appears quite clear that the state cannot provide you any extra compensation. The only reason they could do that would be to release claims. But in order to do that, you'd actually have to have a claim. But you're, you're an attorney. You went to Harvard. You're a lot smarter than me. Am I misinterpreting this? Sir, I'm not deep on the governing law here. I was offered an agreement. I did not suggest the financial payment. I did not suggest the agreement. I agreed to it. I think if, if you think if there's a legal problem with it, there's a different forum to take that up. Representative Outman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gordon, um, Representative Johnson made a really good point. It sounds like either you violated the Constitution or the administration did, or you did, in fact, have legal claims against the state, which you say you don't. Does that sound correct to you? Uh, no, sir, it doesn't. The Constitution clearly states that these types of agreements for public officers are prohibited unless you had claims against the state. Sir, I, I, I am not an expert on Michigan's Constitution. I believe prior to- Would you agree with the interpretation uh, of, this, just, of, this con of this Constitution that either the administration violated the Constitution with this agreement, or you in fact had legal claims against the administration in the state of Michigan? It's a yes or no question. Representative, you're asking me uh, to interpret the Michigan Constitution, a provision of the Michigan Constitution that I have never seen, and I'm going to respectfully decline to do that. Well, I would suggest that you take a look at that. Um, thank you, All Mr. Gordon. Right, step in here. So I'm not an attorney, right? So I'm trying to do my homework before here, but I have some notes from the Constitutional Convention, 1963, Regarding this section, Chairman Erickson explained that this provision uh, dated back to 1850 and, quote, is aimed to prohibit the gratuitous grant of further compensation to officers of the government after the fact. Seems to me that it's pretty clear what we're trying to prevent here and that this did, in fact, occur. I mean, do, do you understand the problem here that we're, we're seeing? 
Representative, this agreement was presented to me by the Michigan Department of the Attorney General, which I believe has primary responsibility for interpreting the Michigan Constitution for the state of Michigan. I would, again, I, I was not there. I do not know. I would surmise that they believed that this agreement was lawful, but I, it was not my position to interpret the Michigan Constitution. Well, the legislature also has a duty to interpret the Constitution as well here. Uh, in my opinion, looking at this, I think it's abundantly clear that if you did not have legal claims against the state, this agreement could not occur. Now, if you had legal claims against the state, that's something this committee would be very interested in. Uh, but you made it abundantly clear that that was not the case. And so it appears to be that this agreement was unconstitutional. If that is, in fact, true, are, are you prepared? Would you be willing to pay that money back to the state, to the taxpayers? Representative, I'm, I'm not going to answer hypotheticals. I'm in no position to evaluate the constitutionality of this agreement. But I'm just saying, if it was, if this agreement was unlawful, you would have to pay this back, correct? Representative, again, it's, it's a hypothetical. I'm not going to go down this path. Okay. Representative Brixey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity uh, to speak. And uh, thank you, Director Gordon, for your uh, dedicated record of service to the state of Michigan. Um, I, for one, very much appreciate uh, all of the lives you helped save during this terrible time. Representative, I said no time. grandstanding. Need to get to your question. Um, I have a question uh, about the confidentiality. So because you believe counsel to the governor was confidential, do you find anything unusual um, in having a confidentiality agreement in your separation agreement? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I mean, as I've talked about, there were difficult conversations, differences of opinion, and those are matters that are appropriately confidential. And so now it didn't didn't strike me as um, I thought it was it was a reasonable request. Okay, section five of the um, agreement includes a full release of claims. So my my interpretation is that's what the state received from um, your severance agreement was a full release of claims. Is is that correct? I believe that's correct, Representative. But there and were no so claims, just to clarify. If you would allow me to finish, Mr. Chair, while I have the floor, um, the fact that there isn't a threat of litigation is not the same as uh, having a potential future claim. And so this is a common and standard uh, practice. All right, that, that's actually not true. It's not a common standard practice when you're dealing with a state officer here. And here's the problem. You're talking about a constitutional provision. I'm going to read it one more time. Neither the legislature nor any political subdivision of this state shall grant or authorize extra compensation to any public officer, agent, or contractor after the service has been rendered or the contract entered into. Now, if we say, hey, there could be some potential claim out there, so we're going to do an agreement, essentially what you have done is you have rendered this constitutional section null and void because you can get around it by just saying, well, there could have been a claim. So you can say, hey, I want to have a sweetheart deal for someone. If you're, say, there's some future governor that they have a buddy of theirs that's a department director and they're going to leave, they can get around this and give them a million dollar payout and say, well, there could have been claims. That's the problem here is that you have a serious constitutional issue. Now, I want to get back to uh, the, the taxpayer well, argument here because it's my job to protect the taxpayers. And I guess I'm trying to figure out, do you believe that the $155,000 payment was a good deal for taxpayers? Sir, I... I Bill, I've answered this question already. Uh, that I was told that this was a typical agreement. I entered the agreement. You are a public servant. You've been a public servant for many years. You've talked about that. Your job is to serve the public, and, and those are the taxpayers. And I would hope that you have a, a deep appreciation of the money that they pay to government to pay people like myself and yourself. Do you believe that $155,000 payment was a good deal for the taxpayers? Uh, Representative, let me, let me, if I may, just step, step back a bit. Um, I, um, for me, the opportunity to serve as the director of the Department of Health and Human Services was the privilege of a lifetime. Uh, 
for me, public service has always been the most important thing in my life. Um, I took the job um, at a time when I was living in Washington, D.C. My family picked up. We moved to Michigan. We sold a house. We bought a house. I then worked uh, incredibly hard around the clock for two years. And in the second year, I had both the responsibility and the privilege to lead the Department of Health and Human Services to the best of my abilities. I worked my heart out in that job and the stakes were enormous and uh, the number of, of lives on the line. I used to read regularly stories about those who had lost their lives and it had a big life, a big impact on me because every life is sacred. And so I worked my heart out in that job. It was a challenging time, lots of stuff going on personally. But, um, you know, I didn't see much of my kids in that time. My parents became ill protesters outside my house. So I, I worked my heart out. And, and every day I would get up and say to myself, uh, how can I do the best possible job on this day to save lives? And the stakes were enormous and the stress was enormous. And I gave it my all. I left it all in the field. I was honest. I was candid. I was willing to, to I was will. I, I always tried to do the right thing. I always tried to do the right thing. And at the end of that time, I, you know, Governor Whitmer said to me, "I want to go a new direction," and I respected that, of course. And I resigned. And I, I then, after that period, you know, for my family, we're going to move back. We're going to return to Washington D.C. There's all kinds of expenses associated with that. So if you are asking me if the taxpayers got a good deal on my public service, with respect, I believe they did. I gave it my all. I believe I was part of a team that helped save thousands of lives. And I think I, I played a role in that group that was meaningful. And I, I make no apologies for my public service, sir. Yeah, we're not talking about your time in public service. We're talking about the deal afterwards because you're terminated at that point in time. I think that's an important difference. I do want to make sure for the purpose of the committee and members here, uh, there are two attorney general opinions about this issue. Uh, there's AG opinion number 5655-1980, uh, Attorney General Frank Kelly, uh, that actually speaks to this, that it does apply to state officers. Uh, there's also AG opinion number 6643 in 1990, also with Attorney General Frank Kelly. So there has been uh, some discussion regarding this. This does apply to state officers. Uh, I think there's been some comments that, oh, this doesn't apply in this situation. It does appear that it would. Representative O'Malley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, your, your uh, last comments, they got me. I understand. And I think everybody on this committee understands uh, and can uh, uh, relate to your comments about your work and your family uh, being part of this. Because I think uh, uh, we all, our, our poor families put up with a lot of stuff. And, uh, and, and so I, I totally respect your thoughts there. But I, and I thought this question when you answered earlier, and after those comments, I, I, I have to ask. You talked about when the call came, when you were on the call the day uh, that you were basically told uh, you're out. It sounds like you were on the call, you're there in the trenches, you got the dukes up, you're ready to go for another day's battle, and the boss comes on the phone and says, hi everybody, you're fired. How'd that make you feel? I mean, you just talked about the passion you had, uh, and I respect that passion. I might not agree with everything you did, but I respect that passion. And you got, it sounds like you got fired in, a, in about a five second call. How'd that make you feel? I'll be honest, Representative, I, I did not feel great in the moment. I didn't feel great for a while after. I, I took some time with my family. And that was lovely. Um, so initially it didn't make me feel great when I reflect and when I think back on my service, I'm very proud of my service. I have no regrets about serving governor Whitmer. I have no regrets about the advice I gave. I feel I fought the good fight. I ran the race and, uh, you know, now I'm going to move on to other things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Legrand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and, and I 
don't want to spend too much time debating the interpretation of the Constitution here because, you know, you're not a court of law director, and so maybe this should be subject to litigation. I, what I want to ask you is this. Um, first of all, um, I, I don't want you to be overly modest here. You're a lawyer, correct? I, I am so. Right. So plenty of people— you know, on at first blush may not think they want to litigate something and time passes and they decide afterwards that darn it, I want to sue, right? I mean, if you get a hit, if you get a hit on your bike uh, by a motorist, your first impulse might be, oh, they were a nice lady. I don't want to sue them. But then you have, you know, lingering health problems and you decide you need health coverage. So you sue later, correct? Sure. That does happen. Right. So you said essentially, and, and I just want to make, make sure I'm clear. Here. You were pretty clear. You had no intention, and you have no current intention to litigate regarding your employment. But you have the potential to raise at least a couple of, a couple of claims that I suggested. Would you agree that that's fair? That sounds right. Again, I, I'd like representatives to stay out of opining about law. I am a lawyer, but I, I know enough to know not to pop off about the that I, have. I appreciate that. Neither you nor I do employment law, and, and maybe uh, Representative Wozniak does. So, you know, it, law covers a lot of field. And so, yes, I'm not an employment lawyer. But I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is the fact that you don't have a current intention to sue wouldn't mean that there's not value in limiting your ability to sue in the future if you changed your mind, correct? Yeah, I, my, my understanding is that that is part of the theory of the case behind separation agreements, sir. And so you sign an agreement which foreclosed your possibility of litigating against the state in the future, essentially, correct? Okay, and you got, com and you got consideration for, uh, for dropping potential future claims, essentially. Is that a fair statement? Potential uh, yes, future claims. That's right. that's right, sir. Right. I'm not saying you planned any, and I appreciate your trying to be honest and deferential about that, but I think we have to be clear. You sitting here right now, if you didn't have this agreement, would, you're still inside the statute of limitations, have the ability to consider claims against the state, correct? That, that, that sounds right. Okay. I, I don't know for sure. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to respond to a couple of those points, Representative LeGrand. I think there's a couple major flaws in the arguments that's being put forward, and those need to be clarified. This idea that there is always any potential legal claims and therefore we can sign an NDA to release those claims for a sum of money, essentially what that does is it takes this constitutional provision and just wipes it out because you will always have that ability to say, well, there could have been claims, so therefore I'm going to do a sweetheart deal for a million dollars to someone and we'll just say it's to release claims, even though there were no claims. So you, maybe you're following the straight up word for word of the Constitution, but you're absolutely violating the intention, the spirit of the law there. And it's, it, once we go down that road, it means nothing. Second off, and I think we have to get to, is the amount of money is important. When you are doing a severance agreement, it's a financial calculation. All right? I'm going to pay, the employer is going to pay the terminating employee X amount of dollars because it's cheaper to do that than to go through those court costs. If we are paying you $155,000, that means someone must have thought that the liability was greater than that. But if there were no indication of any legal claims, then how do you know what that number is? It could have been 10000 It could have been a $1 million, because we have no idea what legal claims were there. So there, there's multiple problems with the arguments being put forward there. In order to release claims in this situation, there has to be some level of claims that are actually indicated to the governor's office. And Director Gordon has made it clear he had no claims he was going to bring to the governor's office. They had a very amicable relationship. There was no problem there. And that is where I believe that the governor actually has violated the Constitution by proposing this. We, Representative Outman. Mr. Chair, could I? Could, I I'm going to go to Representative Outman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gordon, the constitutionality issue set aside, would, would you just acknowledge that these types of agreements are, are highly unusual in state government, one to this magnitude, $155,000, to keep quiet, would you would you agree that's highly unusual in state government? I I haven't made a study of it, sir. You have no no opinion of that then. I, you know, again, I, I have not I have not researched the frequency of these agreements yet. It seems well, unusual to me, but I haven't researched it. I I would say it's quite troubling, Mr. Gordon. And then to refuse to come in and testify when we asked you multiple times, four times, I believe. 
and to not be transparent and say what led to your resignation in the middle of a public health crisis and then getting $155,000 to essentially keep quiet. Would you agree that looks suspicious? Because it isn't just me saying this. It's the, it's the majority of the House of Representatives. It's the people back in my district that are saying this. And exa it's exactly why people don't have trust in our government. Representative, as I, as I said, I chose not to come in initially because I felt that the governor was entitled to confidential counsel. She is entitled to the director uh, who she was comfortable You guys with waived the confidentiality along. agreement. Why not come in and be transparent about it? I, I'm, I'm here, sir. I'm happy to answer. We asked you four times to come in and testify. Pardon? You refused to do so until we had to issue a subpoena. We haven't done this in 20 years. We, you took us to that level. Why not come out and be transparent about it in the, initially? That's what I don't understand. I, we I got a lot of questions. Answer. The House of Representatives has a lot of questions. People around the state have a lot of questions, and, and that's, that's the biggest one. Why not come in and be transparent? Because it looks very suspicious from where I'm sitting. Representative, I'm here to answer any questions that you have. Do you have more questions? For now. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm set for now. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. If we talk about the, the number, you know, why we got that 155, I think it's important to remember that your senior uh, deputy director, who also resigned, received one of these, but it was only for 11000 So a, a huge disparity between the $11,000 payment and the $155,000. And I think that's where you get to the point of what is the liability at stake here. Um, 11000 seems like that's probably a little more of a reasonable number considering you know, if you didn't have any obvious lawsuit, the cost of you just going to court and dismissing a frivolous lawsuit, you know, but 155 is substantially higher. I think that's where a lot of people have a question of what exactly is going on here. It looks like a sweetheart deal to a lot of us. Um, but with that, I'll go to Rep. Hoidinga. Thank you. I'm just trying to remember back to the dates, and it, it seems like, if I remember correctly, um, the day the resignation happened, there was the governor gave a press conference. I might be wrong, but I'm just curious. You did say on the phone call with her, she wanted, she stated she wanted to go into a, a new direction, and I'm just curious, was that a result of you wanting to make decisions based on science and maybe her wanting to go into a different direction. I'm really curious about um, the differences you had that resulted in this. Mr. Chair, I, I think that we're outside the scope of the subpoena here. I think we're into issues of difference of opinion, and I think that's exactly uh, okay, the concerns so Representative we have about confidentiality. Uh, LeGrand objects to the question. Representative Hoarding, can you restate the question? We'll see if it's within bounds. Uh, would you say that your resignation was a result of um, the governor going, wanting to make political decisions and you wanting to make decisions um, based on science. Again, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative LeGrand, uh, as the chair, I reviewed the question. The question is within bounds. The subpoena is related to the termination. I will allow. Thank you. No, that's not how I would characterize it. How would you characterize it? Could you expound? You know, I, I want to make clear the governor said she wanted to move in a, in a different direction. It's just. Um, it's a matter of public record. There are emails out there that, um, you know, as, as you know, the morning that I resigned, we had announced a new order that reopened effective February 1st, certain indoor settings. You know, it's been reported that there was a difference of opinion in the days leading up to that order. From my perspective, it was a reasonable difference of opinion. I think there are areas of black and white in COVID. And then, you know, an example would be masks, mask work. I think there's strong evidence that mask mandates work. I think this is a difference of opinion that was um, in a gray area where I, I don't think that there was a clear right answer. And that's why I made one recommendation. We reached another conclusion. I was quite comfortable signing the order. So do you, in your opinion, you believe that the fact that you made a recommendation, but the governor went a different direction, it was that reason why she said it's time for you to go? I, I, I would be speculating about that. Okay. Representative Legrand. Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I didn't have any cur current questions. I did want to, I mean, 
understanding your concerns about grandstanding, I did I did want to suggest to you on on your getting back to your early questions, early questions like we have a mechanism for interpretation of law in the Constitution, that's the courts, and we have mechanisms for producing laws. And it may well be that our body wants to forestall the possibility of severance agreements going forward. Whether or not they're legitimate, I think, is something that properly uh, could be brought to the court, in which case all severance agreements made by anybody, uh, any legislative body might be invalidated. And that's certainly a possible argument, but I think it's best done through the courts. I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, just to respond to that, when you're talking about money, all dollars are appropriate through the legislature. So I think it is absolutely well within the legislative purview to make sure we're ensuring that this money is not spent unconstitutionally. And that's why one of the purposes of this committee hearing was to go down this road to see what legal claims were in fact there and there were no legal claims. Uh, that was an important fact to establish before we can move forward because if there were legal claims, then this payment could have been legal. Uh, now, then it brings a whole other set of issues of what are those legal claims, and that's something we'd have to get down to. But there were no legal claims. So there does, in my opinion, as someone who is on, you know, in the, the House of Representatives that is responsible for appropriating these dollars, we cannot allow dollars to be appropriated in an unconstitutional manner. That would be a violation of our oath of office. And so I think it's well within our purview to step in here. I re respectfully, I, I agree with you, and I agree that it's an appropriate topic of conversation, and I'm glad we're having the conversation. I would suggest, however, if we're talking about whether something is constitutional or not, it might be most productive if we actually ha let the judicial branch answer the question you've raised, which I think is a legitimate question, which is whether the legislature can do severance agreements at all, if I understand your, your assertion. Thank you. Representative Brixey. Thank you. Um, uh, just to comment along these lines, uh, uh, the legislature can't establish what is or is not constitutional. And in this case, it's the um, AG's responsibility and the judicial branch. So, you know, in order to uh, stay within our role, I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. However, I do have a question uh, for uh, Director Gordon. And um, uh, my question would be, um, Director, there's, there's, there's been a, a ton of talk about transparency in Michigan. Can, can you just talk about your and Governor Whitmer's decision to um, go with the spirit of transparency? Uh, in your decision to waive that uh, confidentiality piece. Representative Brixey, what I would say is that I've described a, a narrow domain in which confidentiality is appropriate when you're talking about candid advice about difficult matters, uh, where I think the ability to have robust conversation confidentially is, is valuable to reaching the right decision. There is a broad range of areas where transparency, much broader, I would say, where transparency is a bedrock value. And I am quite proud of my record in the time I was director around promoting transparency. We worked very hard to provide accurate data. We went out of our way when we saw holes in data to attempt to identify and correct those holes. Come the fall, we, we established, you know, it was something that I was very happy to do was to, to take a briefing that was led by Dr. Sarah Lyon Callow, who's the extraordinary state epidemiologist in Michigan. Dr. Lyon Callow used to do a briefing that was initially just for the, the, the governor and key leaders within the department. It then became a briefing that was for key legislators. And something I was thought was important is that we make that briefing public because the information and the data were important. I think we have always been transparent about public health, I'm sorry, we always were transparent about public health recommendations. So for example, we talk about the restaurants order. I, I believe on that day, I was not present at that press conference, on that day in the press release and Dr. Caldoun both made clear that the public health recommendation was not to, uh, not to eat dinner indoors. So I think that there has been a consistent commitment, mine, the governor, the department to uh, providing the, the data that people need to evaluate what's going on and to providing public health recommendations and uh, I'm sorry, to providing public health information and knowledge in as accurate a way as possible. 
Well, I thank you for that uh, commitment to transparency. I think the, um, you know, the, the flow of information from your office and the administration to the public in the um, ever-evolving uh, uh, understanding of this awful, terrible uh, pandemic we're in was something that was uh, very beneficial and um, something that I appreciate very much, and I, I want to um, thank you for that. If we're, uh, for the chair, um, if we're going to be looking at, um, you know, perhaps a, perhaps a future hearing, we could look at uh, the constitutionality of um, agreements, including the $632,000 of Senate agreements that uh, were out there. I think that would some, be something that we could provide some yeah, oversight and I'll, I'll respond to. to that real quick. So pretty much those agreements are only to employees. All right, those are not, once again, the Constitution here. Mr. Neither the legislature Mr. nor Mr. any political subdivision of this state shall grant or authorize extra compensation to any public officer, agent, or contractor after the service has been rendered or the contract entered into. A Senate employee would not fall under this. This is a situation similar to a legislator. Let's say a month before the end of my term, I say, you know, what? I'm going to resign, and Speaker Wentworth gives me a $155,000 severance deal. That would be unconstitutional, and it should be because I'm a state, I'm a public officer. That's what we're talking about here. To your first comments earlier regarding, hey, this is a constitutional issue that should be dealt with by another branch, fully disagree. Everyone, every branch has a responsibility to uphold the Constitution and ensure that we're following that. We've had plenty of times where we've had other legislation before this committee, other committees, where constitutional issues are brought forward questioning whether a certain bill is constitutional. That is well within our realm to have those discussions. In fact, if we didn't have that discussion, it'd be a dereliction of our job. Uh, so I disagree with that front. Uh, I think Representative O'Malley has a question. More of a comment to follow up on uh, your uh, thoughts, Mr. Chair, and I agree. Because we're discussing whether there's a constitutionality issue here. You're right. It's not necessarily our purview to decide whether it's constitutional or not. We can bring it up. But, it, but with a non-disclosure and then everybody agreeing not to talk, how do you find out? We found out today that there is potential of being very unconstitutional. So I think the Oversight Committee today has actually done some pretty darn good work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would push back and say we always do good work. <laughs> I stand corrected, Mr. Chair. Representative Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, okay, I'm starting to feel like I'm in the mouse wheel. We keep answering some of the same questions over and over again. So I just want to give you this opportunity, uh, Mr. Gordon, to let us know anything else you want to say about your voluntary resignation. Anything that perhaps hasn't been said already that you just want to clear the air about, that's what we're here to listen for. Uh, Re Representative, I, I, don't, I don't know that there is. It was a great honor to serve. I gave it my all every day. I feel that I left it all on the field. Laura Whitmer was entitled to confidential advice. She was entitled to a director with whom she was aligned. And um, I think it's better, better for her, better for the state to have a director with whom she's aligned. Certainly better for, better for this, the department's employees. And you know, I'm, I'm glad, I'm hugely honored to have served and uh, you know, I'm on to the next phase of my life. Representative Legrand. Uh, thank you, Representative, uh, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, we, I think we can agree on, on, on something, which is certainly that it's all of our obligation to, to look at the Constitution and do our best to abide by it as legislators. Um, maybe being a lawyer, I'm a little more interested in getting things like advisory opinions from the AG um, or actually running things through, uh, through the courts. But, I, I mean, I'll just, just to respond to your point, I mean, I'm, it's not at all clear to me looking at the constitutional language that um, my front desker doesn't get covered. I don't know why, he's, why he wouldn't be an agent uh, or a contractor. Um, so uh, I, I understand your argument is that there's some special category here of governmental employees who are covered by this language, but no one else is. But I would say that perhaps the attorney sitting next to you uh, is a, is a, 
he's in some sense a public officer. He's working for the state of Michigan. Uh, he's in some sense an agent of the state of Michigan. Um, and I guess that's exactly my point. I don't, I mean, we've got a single line in the Constitution and lots of lawyers make their, l l make lots of money out of arguing and trying to unpack documents, including constitutions. Um, so I, I completely concede the validity of the question. I, but when we get into the question of what our scope is, I think we pretty quickly start spinning our wheels. You say one thing, I say another thing, and that's exactly where I think we need clarification from, say, the court or the attorney general about what does a public officer mean? What is an agent? What is a contractor? I mean, is a contractor anybody who's a sub who does MDOT repairs on the highway? I mean, I don't know. Um, so it seems to me that this could be a very broad clause. It could be a very narrow clause, but that's exactly where I think we're in an area where much as I want to and am committed to uh, abiding by the Constitution, when we get into areas where I just don't know what the right answer is, uh, that's where we go to the courts or, the, or at least the Attorney General get an advisory position. But I, I do really appreciate your, your bringing this up, and I think this has been a, a very productive discussion. And I know you're not, you don't want grandstanding, but I really appreciate your willingness to actually take questions from both sides on this and have a real robust uh, discussion. I would expect nothing less of you, and I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you. Um, the purpose of this committee is to find truth. Uh, I believe both Republicans and Democrats can find that truth. Some might be better than others, but that's a different discussion. Uh, so as far as who would fall under this definition, I think it's important to note that the Constitution prior to the 1963 Constitution had this same definition plus the word employees in it, and they removed that out of there. So I think that's our, our clear indication that it is a limited scope of people that are being involved. And then when you look at the couple AG opinions that say, hey, a state officer would be someone that is a director of department. So I think there is some clarification there. Any questions from these? Yes, Representative Wazniak. I just add one thing. Yes, go ahead. I, I just want to make clear, throughout my service, I took the law extremely seriously. Law was complicated. There were aspects of change to it. And I always took it extremely seriously. And I also, it was certainly always my uh my intent and expectation, of course, in signing an agreement that I would be complying with the law. So, you know, while I did not explore the ins and outs of the Michigan Constitution, it seemed to me to be an agreement that was fully, fully compliant with the law of Michigan. And, you know, my priority always was, certainly when I was in my job, I always thought first about what was best for the people of Michigan. That was my absolute priority. I worked enormously hard at, you know, real sac, you know, I don't want to say, I, one thing I want to say is like, whatever sacrifices I made pale in comparison to the sacrifices and challenges which are faced by people who, uh, who work on the front lines. But, you know, I worked hard. My focus always, always was saving lives. How can we save as many lives as possible? You know, something, a little bit after I departed, um, uh, the University of Michigan School of Public Health put out a press release about a study they had done. The governor's team, I noticed it because the governor's team promoted it, that said that the pause to save lives, which we had entered in November, had saved the lives of 2,800 Michiganders. And that was a source of, um, to be a part of, of the team and to have led the department in crafting that order uh, in and you know, under the governor's guidance, helping to make the tough decisions that that contributed to that saving of lives was, you know, was an enormous privilege. It's something that I will take with me and think about. Um, you know, I didn't leave the job the way I wanted to, but I think I served in the way that I wanted to. I am hugely grateful to Governor Whitmer and her colleagues and my former colleagues for the opportunity to serve. I continue to be full of extraordinarily uh, extraordinary gratitude and appreciation for all of my former colleagues i think one of the things that um one of the things i regretted about the way that i left uh was just um i wasn't able to say goodbye the way i wanted to and you know when i was director we would hold town halls particularly during COVID. we would hold town halls initially we hold them every week 
with the whole staff. So we'd have thousands of people on a call. And, you know, I would just have the chance to talk to people and to connect with them a little bit, talk about the stress that I was facing. Only imagine the stress that many of them were facing. You know, the department has folks who are working in psychiatric hospitals where there were outbreaks of COVID. It has child welfare workers who are on the front lines having to knock on doors of people they don't know in the middle of the COVID crisis. It has public assistant workers who were continuing to have to go into the office so that they could deliver public assistance. So it was a huge honor to work alongside those, those people. I, I tried very hard to stay connected with them in, in the year of COVID. It was, it was challenging, honestly, because we were all remote, but I, I tried very hard to stay connected with them. I talked about things that were important to me. I talked about my family. I talked a little bit about scripture. I talked about, I just talked about, you know, what really motivated me in the world and our shared commitment to saving lives. So they, they, those staff are, are extraordinary. Uh, my sense of connection with them, uh, you know, is one I will never lose. I'm hugely grateful to Governor Whitmer for the chance to, to serve the state. I wish her, I wish all the residents of the state well in moving forward and moving past COVID. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy now to be at a different phase of my life. Yeah, I just want to make sure, you know, another point of clarification is this constitutional provision applies to the state. Uh, we're not accusing you of going out there and committing wrongdoing here. It was the state of Michigan that I would argue they violated the Constitution by offering this agreement. So we're, we're not saying you are the one that broke the law so much as it was a state that should have never done this. Representative Wozniak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for being here, Dr. Gordon. Um, about four times today, you said that you had differences of opinion with the governor and the administration with regard to your handling of DHHS and the COVID. Um, so I'm trying to go back. This may be a little ancillary to what we've been talking about. But you also said that when the governor approached you on January 22nd, she was talking about going in a new direction. But then you turned around and said your ultimate goal was to save lives. Now, th this is going to result in a ludicrous question in that, do you mean to tell me that the governor didn't want to save lives or you were just dis disagreeing with the method? Because you said she's got the ultimate responsibility. So during that conversation on the telephone where you offered either termination or resignation, that's my question. I'm sorry, if your question is, do I think that she was committed to saving lives? Yes, I do. Yeah, I, that wasn't my real question. My real question was whether or not you were offered termination or resignation. It was it was made clear to me that the governor wanted to go in a new direction. I, as a as a public servant and an at will employee, understood what that meant, and I chose to resign. Okay, and that had nothing to do with the possibility of the claims that were saying that you could have potential claims against the state. Is that correct? You know, I did not, let me try to put it this way. I did not believe that I had claims. Uh, that is my, was my subjective state of belief. I will add, I, I had zero intention of bringing a lawsuit. That being said, to, uh, to a point by Representative Legrand, did I objectively have some sort of claim? I, I am in no position to evaluate that. Thank you for clarifying. Mr. Chair, go ahead. Representative Brixey. Okay. Um, can you can you hear me now? Okay. Sorry. Usually people don't have a hard time hearing me. Um, you know the bill that we this committee just approved, forty five ninety one. I, I and I, I hate to beat a dead horse, but this is a really important thing that we're covering. That required the consideration of the risk of litigation, not the threat of litigation or the start of litigation. And so the standard that we're discussing today is not the actual standard that we established, that this committee established last week in um, House Bill 4591, which states section 7.2 for a state officer um, 
uh, in the executive branch if the attorney general determines that severance pay for the state officer is necessary to serve the best interests of this state based on the risk of litigation, the state may enter into an employment contract with the state officer that provides for severance pay to the state officer if the employment contract releases to the extent allowed by law all claims the state officer may have against the state. And, and you know, neither, neither of the AG opinions that have been cited, neither one of them address the distinction uh, between officer and employee, and neither one deals with the release of claims. One of those opinions uh, is regarding deferred compensation, and the other one is about a retroactive um, pay increase. So the House policy requires an ex um, expressed intent to take legal action, but our bill does not. So, yeah, a couple of points I'll gladly respond to. Uh, under that legislation, and your comments I think are acceptable. The subpoena, the purpose of a subpoena is for oversight and for legislation. We did legislation regarding this, so I will accept the comments. I think it's important to know under that legislation, this agreement that was signed would not be legal. There was zero risk of litigation, as Director Gordon has made it abundantly clear. He was not going to sue. Uh, as, as far as the, the AG opinions, I, I, you can do your own research, uh, but they're abundantly clear that a director is a state officer. Uh, so I guess I, I don't know how you could come up with another view. Once again, it's AG opinion number 5655 in 1980 and 6643 in 1990. Right, but Director Gordon clear. can't make that determination. It's the AG that does. So you're saying the Attorney General was wrong? <laughs> and once again, I have said no, it was I'm, a state responsibility I'm actually responsibility saying you're here. wrong. <laughs> well, that's not the case here. I Once again, I made clear earlier, I said it wasn't Director Gordon who I fault for signing this agreement, who I fault as the state of Michigan for proposing the agreement. Representative Outman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, switching gears here, Mr. Gordon, did, did the death uh, statistics within Michigan play any part in your decision to, um, you know, sign a non-disclosure agreement? Did the governor's policies on nursing homes play any part in your decision to sign a non-disclosure agreement? Just, just wanted to clarify that. Controversial policy, uh, we're one of five states that implemented that, so... Just wanted to make that point and uh, clarify that. Thank you for your response. Representative Legrand. Uh, we, I, I feel like I'm in the Court of Appeals here, but um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I want to, I want to, again, push back on your zero risk. Um, if I, let's say, to, to get my back to my bicycle example, let's say I run you over with my car and you're on your bike, and you swear to me that you won't sue. That doesn't mean that two years from now you're not going to you can't change your mind. Until the statute of limitation expires, you are a free agent, and you can make a determination about whether or not you want to sue me uh, for running you over with my car. Which means that a rational actor in that situation has to say that the subjective opinion of the person who may or may not sue, which can change over time, is not is a factor to consider. I may give you less money if you're standing there saying, I swear that I have a principle against suing people because I believe that in Corinthians it says we shouldn't, Christians shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't sue people. That's great. I may give you less money if, you, if you're making that statement as you're lying on the ground bleeding. Um, but my, your risk of suing me is not zero because of something you say contemporaneously. Your risk of suing me is a complex determination. And frankly, if you and I are bargaining at arm, arm's length, if I give you a good deal, it's not your problem that I gave you a good deal. It's my question of what my assessment of the risk is. And so respectfully, I think the, the executive office, office made an assessment of risk here. Now, we, we can second guess their assessment, but I don't think the risk is ever zero of somebody litigating, no matter what they say to you on any given day. I think it's a fair point you bring up. Uh, is there ever zero risk? Probably not. I would say very, very limited. So this is where we have to get into the dollar amount where I believe that is important, right? The whole point of having that dollar amount is it is cheaper for us to pay this person off than it is to go to court. That's, that's the calculation. You're making a financial calculation. We think we are liable for half a million, so we'll pay 155000 We save money. I get it. He indicated zero legal claims, nothing. 
So you say, all right, so is that 155000 just their basic thing for everyone? No. Senior Deputy Director Esty had a $11,000 agreement. We don't know what claims that she brought forth. My guess is there were no claims brought forth. Well, if neither party brought claims forth, why was one at 155 and one at 11000 Even under your assumption that there is no zero risk, I get that, but neither party brought forward any idea of legal claims. So this $155,000 number was just drawn out of thin air and not actually consistent across the lines of people. So I think that's where we have the problem here. The amount matters, and $155,000 is not cheap. That means that's a significant legal claim against someone. A frivolous lawsuit, yeah, that'll cost you maybe tens of thousands of dollars, but not over 150. So I think that's where there's an issue here. But I'll let you respond. If I could. Um, so my back in the napkin math here is that the cost of having this hearing has, has run about $120,000. So maybe we should run that into the total assessed cost of having made the agreement because the, 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 t the, the time value of all of our time and our staff on this is not trivial. And I figure I'm at least worth 300 bucks an hour because that's what I used to bill out when I was a real lawyer. Um, I figure that's at least the value I'm providing the state of Michigan when I'm at work. Um, so I guess... I went to the University of Chicago, and guys there got uh, Nobel Prizes in economics for uh, talking about exactly this issue. And there's something called the Coase theorem, which applies here. Essentially, um, you know, you're, when you're when you're determining risks and and making those calculations, um, you're talking about a transactional analysis. And in that situation. Monday morning quarterbacking transactional analysis is very, very hard to do. So I just hypothetically speculated. I mean, you said there's a she here. I don't know if this she is old enough to the person who got the eleven thousand dollars severance. I haven't looked at them. I haven't looked at their at their, uh, their their risk factors. But one thing is, they couldn't sue by saying, "My gosh, you're discriminating against men because she's a woman." Um, we've got a uh, an administration that has a lot of women in it. Maybe there's a hostile work environment towards men. I don't know. Uh, maybe that would be a claim that somebody could advance, and, and a man could advance that a woman couldn't. Another obvious argument is age discrimination. I mean, the hardest people to get to employ, and I. I say this is someone's about to get term limited out. The most unemployable people in America are like white men in their 50s, uh, arguably. I may, any man in their 50s, let me put it that way. I'm, I'm sure I'm, it's probably actually harder if you're not white. But it, that's, a, that's a very, a man in their 50s is very hard to get a new job on. And so that's where age discrimination cases uh, come from. And that's a real risk if you've got a man in their 50s who's, who's entering, who's, who's just lost his job. So. Again, the point is Monday morning quarterbacking decisions that are made um, about those risk factors are really, really hard to make. And I'm not sure that it's proper to, to go into any entity and try to do that kind of reverse analysis. I mean, we could do it, but uh, it sounds like it would use a whole lot more time and resources than we, I mean, we should be dealing with issues of billions, which is what we deal with when we deal with a budget, not issues uh, of this level for infinite amounts of time. I think there's, we gotta have some finitude to how long we talk about $155,000. Yeah, several points there. Um, one of the purposes of this hearing was to see what level of risk that was indicated, and there was zero level of risk indicated. I think we have to keep going back to that, and yet the amount paid was over 10 times greater than Senior Deputy Director Esty. So something isn't adding up there. And we still have to go back to that constitutional provision. Under your logic there, anyone can always sign an NDA without providing any sort of claims, and there can be any dollar amount. Because how is there any way to prove otherwise? And so what that does, it opens the door for someone to just run amok over the Constitution and just ignore that section and do sweetheart deals to whoever they wish to. Um, I'd be opposed to that. And I know maybe you think it's only 155000 That's a lot of money to me. Representative Brixey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I really think that it's absurd to suggest that it's the potential plaintiff's job to judge the risk of their potential claims. It, it's absolutely the opposite of that. It's the AG's job. And that was done when uh, they proposed this agreement. You know, are we gonna are are did the are we gonna ask the um, 
uh, employees that received the $632,000 of severance agreements in the Senate if they were going to sue before they got paid off to quietly leave? Are we, are we going to ask them that? It isn't. Once again, they're not covered under the Constitution. That's why we made a very clear distinction. I don't have Deputy Director Essie before me today. All right, there, there's but a difference. The standard here. that you're applying here is not the standard that we voted on in, 40, in 4591. Absolutely, that, you're wrong. The, the legislation we voted on expressly forbid this type of agreement. I'd encourage you to read the legislation. Representative Riley. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gordon, uh, you've already stated a couple times, as was mentioned, that the confidentiality agreement made sense uh, to you and you were going along with it because of the differences of opinion that you may have had uh, with the governor. Uh, I guess I, my question would be like, was science and uh, how science was used to inform or not inform policy uh, part of that? What I would say, Representative, is that there are matters of black and white that arise from science, and then there are matters of gray. And so I gave the example of masks. The science is wholly clear that masks are effective against COVID and they save lives. I think there's a large number of studies at this point that show that mask mandates have been very effective in reducing the spread of COVID. So that's an example of one where I think the science is quite clear. I think Governor Whitmer required the wearing of masks you know, early on. And I think her, her willingness to do that and commitment to doing that in spite of very severe opposition, in my view, unquestionably saved. Is now, I think there are also areas of gray where the science is informative and it is important to listen and take it into account. But ultimately, there's a lot that goes into the decision. And I would say that anytime I was disagreeing with Governor Whitmer, it was in one of those gray area cases. Well, would one of those gray areas be specifically here the uh, debate over PCR testing? I don't know what you're referring to, sir. Well, I'm just referring to the, the th uh, thresholds, the number of cycles that are used for PCR testing. It's a huge debate going on. And I was wondering if that was one of the different areas of differences of opinion since that uh, it has such a big importance on how many people actually have the virus. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar with this issue. I don't now. think this is really within the scope of what we're supposed to be. Do you have any other questions, Rep. Riley? That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. We have two questions left. We are running out of time here. So, Representative Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, you know, the one thing that I think folks who are used to hearing me talk about on this committee is solutions. <laughs> so we've heard a bunch of testimony today. We've asked you a lot of questions. And so, really, Mr. Chair, this question is probably for you because I'm, I'm feeling the main thing that we've been here is to understand the, the dollar amount primarily. And if that's the case, then let's get those questions answered, um, perhaps offline. Can we understand how we even come to these dollar amounts? Because I'm not clear about that yet myself. And uh, the director, uh, our former director, he clearly isn't, he didn't have anything to do with that. He was just presented something and he said yay or nay to it. And he said yes. And so I just want to be clear about that. And then the last thing, I just, I have a quick question, 20 sec, 10 second statement which will follow with a question, because I know that, um, Mr. Gordon, you said that at this point you are now happy to now be a private citizen, right, to see your family and contribute to your country in a new way. And I'm just curious, have you found the new way yet? Because I'm hoping today will be the end of this for you and that you can go on and be a regular citizen. Representative, I, I appreciate the thought. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happily moving on. Um, you know, I, you know I've, I've shared some thoughts. I, I wrote an article today uh, uh, in New York Times about how to address, uh, how to spend money well um, coming out of the, the American Rescue Plan. I am, you know, I'm delighted. I've been a, a fellow at Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan. I've been a public service scholar at the University of Michigan Law School. I will be talking soon about other things that I'm doing. But yes, I, I, I do want to say, um, I'll just say this, Representative Johnson, I was going to say this at the end, but I'll just say it now. You know, 
I respect the committee's authority. I respect your role and the committee's role. Um, I, for reasons I've given, I did not choose to appear voluntarily, but I am here now under, under subpoena. I'm answering questions. And if you have more questions for me, I'm, I'm very happy to answer them. But as Representative Young said, I also feel it's time uh, and appropriate for me, having given it my all and left it all in the field, to be permitted to move on with my life. Thank you. Representative Hoytinga. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you again for testifying. Um, um, I'm trying to stay respect the, the chair's guidelines and stay within the scope, um, but I do represent 90,000 people, and on behalf of them, um, we were, I was hoping to hear reasons for the separation and was hoping to hear you as someone who was making decisions um, that affected our families. Um, and I don't think we're going to hear those answers today. But I will say this, $150,000 in my area, um, that could be six years' work for the people I represent. They, we don't make a lot of money up where I'm at. And uh, Mr. Gordon, you claim that you voluntarily resigned. Um, I've never received a severance agreement um, a month after I've quit a job. And I've worked some pretty good jobs, and um, I didn't even make 150000 So this is a very large number to those I represent. And so although it may not seem like a lot of money to some people, it is a lot of money. And so to receive a severance agreement a month after you left, suddenly, and with no answers as to why you left, um, I'm a little disappointed we didn't get, didn't get to hear more today um, for the reasons you left. But thank you. Representative, if I, if I can just respond, um, you know, I, I've described that Governor Whitmer said, said to me, thank me for my service, and Ted said to me that she was ready to move in a new direction. I was given the opportunity to resign, and I did. And I felt that that was the responsible thing to do at that moment. I, I served, uh, I was not a civil servant. She was the elected governor of the state. She had indicated her wishes. And I think I did what, what one does in that moment. And that is the reason that I resigned. Okay. Well, I wanna thank the committee members. We're running out of time here. Uh, we do have session beginning. Uh, director Gordon, I wanna thank you for finally coming before us, answering these questions. Uh, I think you shed a lot of light uh, into what happened. And I do thank you for that. I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but I'm going to go ahead and read it one more time. Article 11, Section 3. Neither the legislature nor any political subdivision of this state shall grant or authorize extra compensation to any public officer, agent, or contractor after the service has been rendered or the contract entered into. These were dollars that were appropriated by the legislature. The AG opinions have made clear that Director Gordon was a public officer. The agreement was signed after, a month after. Uh, to me, it's a quite clear violation. And then we say, well, it's because of there's an NDA. If we're going to allow that, then we might as well just get rid of the section in the Constitution because then any NDA can just move over this without any claims brought forward. Director Gordon has made it abundantly clear that there is an amicable relationship between him and the governor, that he had no interest, no indication that he would sue the governor. The governor's team had no reason to suspect that he would sue them. And they certainly didn't have any reason to suspect that they were liable for over $155,000. If they were, that's some pretty significant unlawful actions occurring, and I'd like to know what that is, but we don't think that's what happened. We have to look at the taxpayers. That's who we represent. And when we look at this deal, this was a month afterwards, all right? The contract has ended. What did the taxpayers get? They lost $155,000. What did they get in return for it? And at this committee hearing, what we were told was nothing. He was not going to sue. So we lost $155,000. That right there shows that we have to continue to ensure that these things don't occur. That's why that legislation that we passed out recently is so important, because it will prevent this type of stuff from occurring again. I want to thank the committee members for your time on this issue. And seeing no further business, the House Oversight Committee is adjourned.